God. I want to mention uh, several things. Uh, next Sabbath, we will not have a worship service, right? We, yes, we will have worship service here, but we're inviting as many as you who are able to come go to the church retreat, that's number two behind me here, and enjoy a powerful uh, opportunity to fellowship and hear a message by Pastor Leclerc. You don't want to miss that. And uh, number one, I just want to mention our deacons. We have a disciple training right after the service, actually at 2 o'clock. And then our prayer seminar. I'm going to let you know, August 30, you don't want to miss Pastor Pavel Goya's powerful m seminar on prayer and also his testimony. You won't want to miss this because it took me a long time to be able to get in here. He's my good friend of mine, and in fact, we're sharing pulpits because of, of our discipleship and prayer seminar training that we're doing together. So I want you to remember this. I want to also invite you to take a look. This event right here, this picture is taken uh, in West Africa, where the World Health Organization is declaring the Ebola virus outbreak as now serious matter. This is not just a local African continent issue. They said this is a global issue that we need to be concerned. The threadbare healthcare system of Liberia, Sierra, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, three of the world's poorest countries, lack even with the basic public health care network before the current Ebola epidemic struck. And they're saying, we're in trouble. We can't control this. It is spreading like crazy. We need help. Ladies and gentlemen, this, are, this is one of the signs that we are nowhere nearing in the soon coming of Jesus. They're saying, what in the world is happening? Literally hundreds of people are being contaminated and dying. They said, we just don't know who's contaminated anymore. In fact, they're afraid, the staff, the workers, they're afraid to go to, to those uh, infested, uh, contaminated area because their friends are getting contaminated. And this outbreak is moving faster than we can control it. They're saying, what can we do? What can we do? The next news, as if not, if the news around the world is not exciting enough, my friends, I want you to see this. The, in the last month, uh, the ISIS, you may have heard that, it stands for Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, now just called the Islamic State, has taken over large portion of Syria and Iraq. And on July 1, Abu Qar al-Baghdadi, the leader of the Caliphate, basically was on his way to conquer Rome. The ISIS had been killing Christians, if you've been watching CNN, especially yesterday, they've been killing Christians and all, the, all they're gathering all the women, especially under 35, and they are forcing them to, to, um, to marry, to marry the radical Muslim men. And kids, there's at least 40,000 Christians that were trapped on the mountain, and many of them were dying, not knowing what to do, where to get help, and they're asking countries, open your borders so we can get some refuge. You know what? As, as this was happening, the people are calling for help. And they said, who else can help us? Who else can help us but the Pope? The Pope Francis urged and made an action, basically on Thursday, a world action against the Islamic State. He said, stop what you're doing. We need help, Western world. We need help, the rest of the world. And guess what? Because of that, because of that, President Barack Obama listened, listened, and sent fighter jets to drop 500-pound bombs to the Islamic militant targets. Now, some of you say, well, pastor, this is a regular conflict. But what I want you to know, my friends, this is fulfilling Revelation 13 to the T here where the second beast is giving support to the first beast. And so if you just listen and watch carefully, prophecies is being fulfilled right before our very eyes, right before your very lifetime. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 4, 
40 to 45, it says the final conflict between Islam and Christianity where Bible scholars are saying the king of the north, basically that's the papal-led Christianity, retaliates against the rush from the king of the south, from the is- radical Islam. And there the final conflict breaks like a whirlwind, followed by a loud cry. Judgment begins and then, judgment ends, and then Jesus comes again. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know this very worship service we are having here, the most exciting time, even before the previous Sabbaths, previous years that you've ever lived, because the signs are being fulfilled. Indeed, Jesus is coming soon. I am so excited about this here because you know what? You do not need to be afraid. Like the song that was saying, if your robe has been washed in the blood of the lamb, right? He will put his his care and protective hands around you. Amen? Amen? Pray with me. Father in heaven, Lord, more than ever before, we need your very presence in this service. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray. I pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon everyone here today. On those who are watching their, their father from, inter, from the internet, I pray that you will pour your spirit in such a way, help me to be able to preach this message boldly and clearly for your glory. Lord, I pray, bind the enemy, cast him out. He's not welcome here. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray. Speak through this weak vessel. Lord, I pray that we may hear clearly your message, what we need to do. Thank you so much for hearing us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Hold up your Bibles, my friends. If you have an iPad or iPhone, you're using your Bible, then hold it up. Say with me, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Do you believe it? Amen. Amen. Our message today is transforming discipleship, making a saving impact, part two. Part two. You know, if you had a company that had 20% of the people just working, but the rest of the 80% are just sleeping. What do you think is the future of that company? You'd be concerned, right? You'd be worried what's going to, go, what's going to be taking place in that organization. You're going to be concerned that company will not have any future, right? Because 20% just doing the work while the rest of the 80% are just sleeping, being lazy, or just doing nothing. You know what's interesting, my friends? Unfortunately, that's the state of the church, of God's church today. Just right before when all the most exciting things of earth is going to be taking place, the climactic events of history and prophetic events are going to be taking place and the people of God asleep. Amen. You know what, my friends? Thank God, God is in charge, Amen. right? Amen. Thank the Lord. I have absolute confidence that our Lord will restore to his full purpose of what he designed of that. When he said, go and make disciples of all nations, the people of God will respond. The people of God will say, you know what, pastor, we're waking up. We're waking up. We want to be part of this. Now, let me tell you some of the problem with the general malaise attitude of, and culture of the people for generations or for decades, basically, because the, because we have allowed a transition where it's become a focus on the pastor, membership became an optional issue now with many churches. You know, one of the things that I have here in my wallet, I'm very proud to say I have a membership with Costco. (laughs) Just pay my fee once a year, and you know what? When I go to the door in Costco, Pull in my car, I'll go like this. <laughs> I don't even have to say, show my, you know, tell them and show them. I just go like this. And walk away, right? And they say, come in, shop, till you drop. <laughs> right? Because I'm a member of Costco. 
But you know what? I don't have to show up every week. I don't have to show up every day because you know what? I just have the option of being able to go in, right? Unfortunately, a lot of our members are looking into church as a membership. A membership, you know what? I can just come in whenever I want to and I really don't have to do anything much because you know what? I paid my dues once a year. Hello, are you with me? And God's people need to realize this has to change. We have to go back to the divine blueprint the way Jesus established his disciples in that he established this so that way just before Jesus comes again, it culminates to his believers, group of Christians are so fully committed as disciples, they're ready to change and turn the world around. Am I worried? No. Not so because God will restore everything back to its original purpose. Let's go back to now to the Word of God. And it's interesting enough that the Apostle takes us, the Apostle Paul takes us to where that originates in terms of this term. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Even though I'm flashing on the screen, open your Bibles. Open your Bibles and let's take a look in Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 11. I want you to see how this is so critical and important for God's people to be able to respond here. Take a look in verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Are you with me so far? Amen. And notice what happens here in verse 12. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Take a look again here. I'm going to flash this pointer on the screen. Take a look. The reason why Christ gave this this, uh, spiritual gifts, leadership gifts, is to equip the saints. Let's stop there for a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, who are the saints? All of us. The church, the whole church, right? To equip the saints to do what? For the work of the ministry. And one more thing, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. So let's break it down. Some of you say, what is the work of the ministry? Let's take a look about that. The work of the ministry, is it praying for people? Yes, Yes, it is. Is it visiting people in their homes, hospitals, and workplaces, different locations? Yes, it is. That's a part of the work of the ministry. What about giving Bible studies? Yes. Yes? What about calling on people? Yes, you can say caring for people. You can go on with a long list here as part of the work of the ministry, right? And and you know what? The other word of edifying is what? Building up, building, teaching, encouraging, caring for people, discipling other people. What you see here, my friends, what Paul took from Christ's design is saying that All these leaders, pastors, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, right? Well, you know what has happened is this. I want you to see that the main job of the pastor is equipping and discipling. So if that is the job in equipping and discipling, guess who's doing the work of the ministry? You are. So think about this. Well, pastor, okay, put it to how do you relate this to current events? If the devil was planning a strategy to know, he, because remember, he's been studying for 6,000 years the history of mankind, and he's been throwing out his arsenal of sins and, and havoc around the world, He knew that just before Jesus will come again, according to the Bible, there's a group of people in Revelation 14 who will be so committed to Jesus Christ, they will follow Jesus to the right or to the left. They're so so not only committed, they're so obedient to Christ, they're willing to go all out for Jesus. So you know what the devil says? My strategy is this. Turn the work this work around, instead of the pastor 
discipling and equipping, let him do the rest of the work. Let him do the work of the ministry. Let him do the equipping, the, the nurturing of the body of Christ. Well, you know what I'm finding out? Literally, as I go from various conferences from different states and locations, you know what I'm finding out? Pastors are saying, we are burning out. You are burning out. We can't stand this anymore. We're called to be a pastor. In fact, when we were in Alaska, there was a young man there. He was just a theology, he was a theology major, okay, theology major going into the ministry. But he was already discouraged. Why? Because he's seeing, how am I going to do all this work? You see, we have taken and bought into that, to that, I call it, switch bait and switch that the devil has done and so that way the model we have today is still pastor centered. Instead of you being equipped, all of you are watching, oh let's see what pastor's gonna come, pastor Sanders gonna come up today I can't wait to hear it you know what my friends, I want you to know I'm trying to switch this format to equip you, empower you and share with you what we need to do to make these changes because the job is to equip the saints to do ministry and equip the saints to edify the body of Christ. Amen? amen. Oh, that's not a strong enough amen right there. Amen. You know what, by the way, I taught this to the people of Alaska about the Zulu people. Now, some of you are coming here for the first time, and let me tell you about the Zulu people in South Africa. They're very passionate, they're very aggressive as a people, and when they become Christians, they're also passionate and aggressive too. So when they say amen, they say amen. They say amen. Amen, brother. They say amen. amen. And you know what? The devil hears that. He goes like this. Whoa, whoa they really mean it. They're really serious. They're really responding. They really believe this message. Amen? amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, take a look. The whole people of God are the ministers. All of you are the ministers. Right? Because by the fact when Jesus died on Calvary, what happened to that veil was torn. Right? That meant we no longer need a priest like in the Old Testament to mediate before you. You come directly to Jesus Christ as for forgiveness of sins. By that fact, you have become ministers. This is biblical. Amen. The only problem is, many people today not realize that, oh, I didn't know that. I thought I am just a member. No, 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 my friends. This is something, I want you to see this. You have been called to be ministers of God. Amen. Pastor, I expect you to be there to get me through it. If you don't show up, you're failing your job. And you're failing to be a pastor. Because you're supposed to do this. And you know what, my friends? People have gone in, and I've actually had people say, you know what? I've gone to the hospital. This is after a week or so later, after this person had been in the hospital. Oh, Pastor, what took you so long? What took you so long? I said, finally, finally, someone's visiting me from the church. I said, you know what? Didn't? Didn't this person visit you from church? Oh, yeah, 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 but just, he's just an elder. Or did this person visit you? Oh, yeah, yeah, but they're just from the church. They're not the pastor. Remember, pastor, your prayers are very holy. <laughs> You're way above in God's eyes, and he answers your prayers like nobody else. No, my friends, let me tell you the truth here. The fact that God answers my prayers or your prayers is because you have a close relationship with him and you believe and claim his promises by faith through his word. Amen? Amen. And when God hears his child of his, pray, say, Lord, I need your help. Lord, please forgive my sins. Right away, instantly, God answers your prayers. Amen? Amen? And so this is what you need to realize it's not because I'm a pastor. Remember, my job is, according to the Bible, is just to equip you, train you. Does that make sense? And so I'm looking at a bunch of pastors here, a bunch of ministers. 
in one conference, when I was in Michigan, the conference president said, pastor, how many of you pastors? It was a bunch of pastors, so workers training, meeting. How many of you pastors would like to have an associate pastor? Many of them raised their hands. I kept my hands now. You know why? Because I had several dozen of members who are being trained in discipleship who are lay ministers for Jesus Christ. I don't need just one. I, I'm, see, look at this. I have all of you as lay ministers before Christ, right? So what's the problem? Take a look at this. Number one, diversion from the primary calling. Pastors have taken on what is not their work to do. And I said to the pastors, because I have the opportunity to train pastors, I said, pastors, you need to stop that. Stop it. You're the fault. You're at fault of this too because you love. You love the attention. You know what the model is? Imagine if I could draw a circle right here, the pastors in the center, and a bunch of members right there in the sides. The arrow is pointing in. They say, pastor, what can I do to help you? Pastor, what can I do to assist you? You know what, friends? That's just like music to the ears of the pastors. Why? Because for so many times, for so long, they've been doing all the work. So any help they can get, they're just so excited. But I tell the pastor, don't get used to this because that's not biblical. As, many, as much as people will raise their hands and say, I'd like to help you, don't, go, don't fall for that. Your job is... Imagine a circle there, and the arrow is pointing out. Basically, the pastor is going to you as I'm going out to you and saying, what can I do to equip you, to assist you, to be equipped to be lay ministers of God so you can do the work of the ministry for Jesus Christ? Amen? Amen. So here it is. Take a look, friends. In Ephesians 4, how long do we keep following this pattern? Is this only for a day, a week, a month? Take a look in the Bible. The Bible answers it in verse um, 13. Till we, all, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Are we all united yet? No, not yet. It says, unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Everybody at the full knowledge of the Son of God yet? No, we're still learning. We, every day we're growing to learn more about Jesus. A son of God to a perfect or mature Christian, right? So that means, ladies and gentlemen, what ha- is happening here until we come to the unity of their faith, until everyone is becoming a full Christian in Jesus Christ. To the measure, take a look at this one. I love this part. To the measure of the stature of the what? Fullness of Christ. Do you see that word, fullness of Christ? That means, my friends, when you as an individual, when you as an individual are so full of Jesus Christ, right? You're you're filled with his spirit. You're filled with his love. You're filled with his, his, his mission and vision. You're praying like Christ prayed. Am I making sense so far? Amen? See, what happens when you allow to be equipped, you will get to that state. Do you see, the, do you see the, the part here? Remember the ver- earlier verse we had? Otherwise, if you, if you want to break the cycle, you, want to be, you need to be equipped. Amen. If not, we will not get to the fullness of Christ in our character. Take a look at this. In verse 14, that we should no longer be children. Notice comma. See the comma right there? We should no longer be children. That means we're growing up. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. You know, when I was a little boy, I was a skinny kid. Very skinny. Seems like I was very emaciated, hardly fed, because I had five other brothers that were bigger and, and, uh, and able to eat more food than I could eat. I grew up in, in a family of six boys, six boys, no sisters now. When my mom cooked, it wasn't just a little pot, it was just big industrial size. And she cooked to feed the boys. And we, did, you know, we didn't only just eat 
one serving. We gave one to two servings, three servings. So my mom knew better. But I felt like I was the, the, this, the one that got the least of amount of food by the size that I was. So whenever I'm walking outside and it's, and it's a cold, windy day, I feel like, have you ever walked in, in, in a cold, windy day and the wind's blowing and you're, just, and you're trying to go forward and you're going backward? Right? According to what Paul is saying here, a child is easily tossed back and forth, right? Because you know what? Guess who's blowing the winds? So it's sending the winds. The devil's sending the winds of problems and persecutions or trials. And you know what's happening? People, people are just blame, being blown away. Now, if I could just flip a switch right here and take all of you and, and place you in Erbil, Iraq, okay? Yeah. All of you will be running for your life from the ISIS, yeah. right? You know what the Christians are doing? If you heard my, what I shared earlier, they're running for their life. In fact, CNN pictured some of them bunkering inside the church from what they know, they perhaps they, they can be sheltered. The ISIS right now is beheading even children and putting them on stakes. Adults, women, they're, they're just beheading them. And Christians are being, being, uh, being uh, you talk about sacrifice. The word is convert, leave, or die. Wow. You're talking about big statement right here, right? Toss to and fro and care about with every wind and doctrine. What this means, my friends, when you are being equipped like the word of God states, you know what it does to your faith? It anchors your faith. It anchors your faith in the word of God. It anchors your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. That when you see at this point that you believe that, you know what? My, since my life is in Jesus Christ, it really not matters whether you live a year, five years, or ten years or more, because you're safe in the hands of God, right? Amen. You're safe in the hands of Jesus. Amen. You see what's happening here, my friends, is this. In verse 15, but speaking the truth, how? In love. Now, we may grow up in all things in Jesus. That's what's happening. This is why I'm, I'm sharing this, my friends, with you. And you will hear me share this in various pieces throughout this year. Is because I want you to grow up in Jesus. I want you to grow in full stature of Jesus. Who is the head? Is Jesus Christ, right? So what happens according to this in verse 16? From whom the whole body joined and knit, how? Together. Knit together. You know what, my friends, that means. All of you right now are just like this, sit seated. But knit together means you all are knitted and enmeshed together. You've learned to fellowship with each other. You've learned, my friends, to pray for each other. And by the way, I want to say thank you for those of you who so got to receive the email for praying for my daughter, Lauren, who had her hip surgery last Wednesday. She's doing fine. But it was good knowing that people were praying besides my family. Amen. You don't know what it's like unless you've gone through that. You just said, you know what, I think God I have a church family that I can lean on. Besides leaning on Jesus, right? You're knit together what every joint, what does it do? It supplies. Every joint supplies. You know what is interesting? Every joint in your body has a purpose. You know what? I, I learned more about that because my daughter Lauren was so much in pain when she got out from the hospital that they had to do a nerve block. Dr. Hardy, you would, you know, she won't wake up. And this is Dr. Hardy's specialty. And Lauren wouldn't wake up. And so they won't, couldn't keep her there for the whole day. So they decided to do a nerve block to block the pain. And so I, <laughs> I should have shown a video, you know, but my daughter wouldn't like that. 
she, Julia and I would, she would flop her head back and forth. I said, Lauren, it's time to get up. Oh, where am I? And I just fall asleep. And so finally, Julia and I had to carry her like this and put her, in, help her in a wheelchair so we can wheel her out in the hospital. Now, one of the things when we, were, when we got to our driveway, we have about eight steps or seven steps. And I had to literally carry her because her leg is, you know, won't move. She has no strength and because there was a nerve block there. But it was so funny, my daughter Elizabeth, instead of helping, she was taking a video. I got to take a video of this. <laughs> <laughs> so Juliet and I, excuse me, Julia and I are lifting her up and her leg won't move. And so for the next 24 hours, she had crutches. You can, the leg would hardly move, just like this. Okay, they, now what I'm getting at is this. If you have a joint that doesn't supply what it's supposed to do, it affects the whole body, yeah. right? So my, my main thing to you, my friends, God wants you to be equipped so you can supply for Jesus' glory and honor, right? Amen. And if you're not supplying what you're supposed to supply, you're not giving glory to God. You're not helping the rest of the body. Amen? Yeah. Take a look. According to the effective working by which every what? Part does its share. Every part does its share. So that means all of us said, you know what? The devil doesn't like this. Because when the people of God hears this and say, you know, I want to do something about this. I want to be an active part instead of just sitting around. The devil says, uh oh, that means trouble, right? Because there'll be more people praying, there'll be more people sharing the good news, trying to help people learn more about Christ. He doesn't like this. Take a look. What does it do? It causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. I said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, let me ask you this. And I tell this to pastors why don't programs work? To make disciples. You know why? Several reasons. Number one, it tends to be information based. Even what I'm sharing with you could be information based, but my, my call to action to you is don't just say, good, good sermon, Pastor. I want to do something about this. Because you know what? My, I'm going to tell you this will be just words that will pass by, goes in one ear and goes out the other ear. Unless you say, Lord, would you please make this real in my life? Amen? Amen. Amen. Lord, you've given, me, you've given me grace. You've given me the promise of eternal life. Help me to be an active disciple for you. Amen. Right? Amen. When you pray that, do you think God will hear that prayer? Yes. Now, remember, if you have not prayed the prayer of asking Jesus into your life, uh, you're in another channel. You're in another world. Are you with me so far? Because we're not in the same frequency here. What I'm sharing with you to be in the frequency where Jesus is saying, I need you to be my disciples. I'm going to give you all the resources of heaven. You need to invite him in. Number two programs are the one preparing or the many, meaning there's only one person. What I shared with you last week is this. Basically, for this to work, you have to take three individuals. By the way, let me ask you, how many disciples did Jesus have? Twelve. Now, you will have to remember Jesus had his twelve disciples. Wherever Jesus went, his disciples went along with him, right? And you know, with his disciples, what's interesting, Jesus spent time with them, teaching them and training them. But I want you to know, friends, even from the twelve, Jesus had an inner circle, circle with three close disciples. Who are they? Who are they? Peter, James, and who? John. This is his inner circle. And you know why? Because Jesus is trying to teach a dynamic here. The principles of his kingdom on discipleship, you need at least three individuals that you can share your vision, you can share 
Remember when Jesus was hurting? When, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Right? He didn't go to the 12. He went to the 3. Oh, please, will you pray for me? Please, will you pray for me? See, you need to have your circle of three. Three people who will support you. But don't make the mistake Peter, James, and John did. They let Jesus down on the Garden of Gethsemane. You don't have to, to fall for that temptation. Why? Because they were not in tune with Christ. They missed that great opportunity. Can you imagine to, to be a blessing for Christ? Here's another one. Programs are characterized by regimentation. What I mean by this is not, it's not a set of programs where I'm we're trying to get to you. I want you to know all of you are different. Why, especially in our church setting, we have people from, from, from all over the world here. So you're very unique and you have specific needs. So you have various education level or, or sets of needs. And so this is why it's so important that you have to have that group of three. And number four, finally, it says that programs generally have a loss, low personal accountability. Now, let me explain this, friends. This is why it's so important. I'm going to share this from the pulpit here because you need to see this. When you have your group of three, they're the group of your three. You would say, will you hold me accountable? Will you ask me questions? Hey, how are you doing with your time with, with Christ, with your devotional? Did you spend time with Jesus, right? They're just like individuals that will encourage you. They're not there to criticize. They encourage you. They're going to be praying for you. Why? Because we're in the same journey together, getting ready for the soon coming of Jesus. Am I making sense so far, my friends? You cannot just depend on the coming to church on a large group like this because it's not going to work. Yes, you're going to, make, you're going to be blessed. I want you to know you're going to be blessed from the messages that are going to be preached here, from the worship experience, but you need to be part of a small group and you need to have your inner circle of three. Amen? Amen. Take a look. Let's go to the next one. Proximity produces disciples, meaning having someone close by in an inner three produces also relationship. Now, what does proximity mean? Meaning being close by. And I want to tell you, because being a marriage counselor, those of you who have a long-distance relationship, it is going to be very difficult for you to have that long-distance relationship. Unless you're on the phone, Skyping each other, every day is going to be very difficult to hold a long-distance relationship. I can guarantee you. Okay? Why? Because I counsel couples at this point who are in crisis. Uh, because the relationship at this point is long-distance. Proximity produces relationship. It brings closeness. Why? Because you know what? We need that touch. We need to see their face. We need to hear their voice. We need to be able to, to, to be in the same room where they are. Amen? Amen? Now, some of you, because of certain circumstances, have to be apart. And then you really need to pray to God and work hard to, make, to maintain that relationship. Amen. Now, let me tell you, by the way, Proximity also, sometimes you can even in the same house and be a long distance with each other. Oh, that's pretty deep. Did you hear me? You can be in the same house, in the same room, in the same bedroom, but you're miles apart. And I want to let you know that you need to pray. Say, Lord, please, forgive me. I know when I was, when the computer, computer boom was just coming up, you know, remember the, learning about the computer, Mike, when I was just about a few years married, my wife was saying, Julia was saying, "Hun, you're married to that computer. Okay, hon, what did you say? You, you're, ma you're married to that computer. Why I spent so much time in that computer? And so finally I learned, I said, you know what, here I'm giving counsel to other couples. I have to make sure I'm doing the same thing, Okay. And so I continue to make sure that I stay close to the heart of the one I love. Proximity produces relationships. Here's another one. Take a look at this. Disciples are made in iron sharpens iron intentional relationships here. So this is why you have to say, by the time you leave today, 
uh, we need you to be looking and say, Lord, who can I have this three? Uh, three friends in this church or someone that I can say, they're not just buddies that's going to be for socializing, but for your spiritual growth, my friends. Because remember the passage that Jack Tucker read? If you lose your soul, you gain the whole world but lose your soul, it's not worth it, right? You have lost what? Everything that you've been working for in this world. Yet when you have those three, they're praying for you. When you happen to be tempted and going astray, they're saying, Lord, please help this. Help my good friend to go back and, 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 com and come to you, right? Amen. Lord, please. And you're pleading before the Lord. Lord, please, Jesus, please help this person. Do you think God answers the prayers of friends, yes. especially if it's family members? Yes. Amen. Those of you who are going to be leaving for the universities in, in the next week or so, find three persons, three individuals that would you, would you covenant with me, a pact with me that for at least we'll meet once a week. I need your help. Let's help each other together, right? Here it is. Take a look. Let's go on to the next one. Each disciple is a unique individual who grows at a rate peculiar to him or her. In other words, that's why I can't set up a general program and say, everybody, you just need to do this, follow one, two, three, four, five, six, and you'll be done. You'll be an automatic disciple. We don't do that. We don't, we're not a, a company that just plops and here comes a disciple of Jesus Christ. You need that close fellowship in spirituality and praying and studying the word together. As you continue to see here, take a look on the next one. Focus on personal growth needs that calls on them to die to self. Did you see the word there? Die to self and fully to what? Live fully to Christ. And I'll be saying, Moses, what are you doing to die for self today? For Christ for this week. By the way, when you have that relationship, he's not going to be offended. Right, David? What are you doing to live fully for Jesus this week? Right? And so, and so this is our questions that, that basically will be direct and ask us that question. Remember this that I shared with you? What happens is this. When we're investing in a few, as Christ did, we're able to internalize God's word in a special, powerful way. Let me share this next slide here in a moment. Uh, take a look at this one. This one is uh, Nikita. Nikita is a, was a Russian peasant who grew up in, in, in the Oscars of Russia in, with, in a Christian home. Now, Nikita, basically, let me just get the, the right wordings here. Oh, let me get that right. You know, that's the problem here with this side bed here. I don't have my pages can zoom to that. Now, let me tell you, Nikita had loving parents and cared for him when he was growing up. They taught Nikita how to memorize scriptures. In fact, it was known that Nikita, Nikita to memorize the whole four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the problem is this, is that even as Nikita was memorizing scriptures, there was something here that was missing. And what was missing is this, because Nikita grew up to become a, a, a political leader and, oh, here you go, a political leader by the name of Nikita Khrushchev. Now, sadly, in his adult life, this young boy who grew up in the truth of scripture, basically, without a doubt, who was nurtured by the teaching of the word of God, late in his life, recalled, he said, you know, my mother was very religious, like was my father and my grand, grandfather. And but the problem is, he became a leader during the murderous show trials of his predecessor of Stalin. Khrushchev gave his unyielding to support to political bloodshed, 
regularly met his arrest quotas in the provinces under his leadership and personally signed to death the death sentences of thousands of Russians, many of whom have been his personal friends. Furthermore, Khrushchev prided himself on the scorn that he had for religious matters. Rising to total power, he eventually proved a fiercer scourge on Christianity than even Stalin. Under his leadership, a large percentage of churches were shut down in the USSR. In the end, it mattered not that Khrushchev had been a model pupil in a Bible church. Because why? Listen to this. He never allowed the word of God to truly affect his life. 2,000 years ago, Jesus taught an important message over and over again. Life must be lived according to the word of God. John 8, 31, 32 states to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold my teaching, you are my, really my disciples. Then you know the truth, and the truth will set you what? Free. Free. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you this. The greenhouse that I've been praying and preaching and asking, Lord, Lord, let it take place right here. It has to be in this place here. The greenhouse of the Holy Spirit greenhouse, basically where rapid growth toward Christ-likeness can take place. We need this. Why? Because time is running out. Time is running out. What we should have been doing many years ago and neglected, now we're realizing Wow, we're running out of time. Look at the world events. They're falling apart. They're fulfilling right now, right? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you this. The goal of what we're trying to do is that you become a self-initiating Christian, reproducing and making disciples Christian, and being fully devo devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. Find someone. If it's a family member, if it's a relative or a friend that is a, true, a Christian that you can trust, will you pray for me? Do not leave this place without being covered with someone praying for you, right? But more so, not just praying for you, saying, will you hold me accountable, right? Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Man, my, my friends, I want to tell you this. More than ever before, I'm just telling you, I'm excited, really. I'm not afraid of all these world events take place. Because you know what? Even when ISIS said, we will raise the flag of Allah in the White House. They're really threatening the Americans. Yes, sir. You know what? That's just the beginning of more problems to come. Right. My trust is not in what the U.S. military can do to defend me. Every day, I lean on Psalms. Let me take my time here. So I'm going to be on the screen. You should jot this down. You should be taking time here to already learn this and memorize this. Psalm 91. Amen. He who dwells in the secret place of the Almighty shall, above the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him I will trust. Amen? Amen? Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler yes, and from the perilous pestilence. Thank you, Talking about Ebola, he will deliver you from the perilous pestilence. Amen. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. You can sleep in peace, my friends, right? Every night. People are afraid, oh, I don't want to turn on the news because it's scaring me. I can't sleep. I'm so worried. Remember this promise, my friends. Remember this promise. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow, or you must say missiles that flies by day nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. 
Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your, what does it say? Habitation. Habitation. You know what that means? Your home. How many of you like to go home? Yeah. Right? You know, when I, was, when I was in Alaska, I enjoyed my time there, but I couldn't wait to get home. There's no place like home. Yeah. Here it's saying, making God your habitation, making God living in your home. Your habitation, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Amen. For he shall give his angels charge over you. Amen? Amen? My friends, claim this promise right here. To keep you in some of your ways. All of your ways. Right? They shall bear you up in their hands. Lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. And finally, because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me. And what? And I will answer him. Hallelujah, right? Are you with me so far, my friends? You want God to answer when you call? I heard one amen right there. You want God to answer when you call? Amen, Amen, my friends. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. May and Soya, come here and sing for us. Sing for us this song. Listen carefully to the song as they sing this. is where we go and help us to be wise in times when we don't know Joy, love, and let the light of heaven 
Amen? Amen. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, my friends, I want to tell you, as the world is falling apart, you do not need to fear a single thing. The promise God gives to us right there in Psalm 91 that beautiful song they just sang. He keeps you in his eyes. But that, that can't take place unless you, you, com- you come and say, Lord, I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you my heart. Because what Jesus is looking for is not just the general malaise attitude, but saying, Lord God, I'm done with just sitting around. I'm done with doing nothing. I'm done with just just coming here every week and really not having an active part. I want to be your disciple, Lord. But some of you here, God is calling and saying, because you've never been baptized, and you need to make that decision to be baptized. Say, Lord Jesus, I want to give my life. I want to study your word. I want to prepare for baptism. I've been praying. I said, Lord God, you have brought people here who needs to secure eternity by giving their hearts. This is no time, my friends. This is not a game. It's not a gimmick. I'm not here to to just preach and just say, okay, that was fine. I'm done with this. I want you to know that I'm praying for you. My wife, Juliet, and I and other people are praying for you that you will commit and give it all to God, not just hold back now. Give it all to God. How many of you will say, Lord, count me in? Count me in. I want you to make a decision. Stand up if that's your desire. And I want you to stand up, but stand up only if this is your desire. Say, Lord, I want to fully commit my all to you. I'm not here for numbers in terms of people just making a decision. I'm here for people who's wanting to commit all to Jesus. Jesus wants to give it all. He wants to give it all to you. He wants to pour out the Holy Spirit in such a way you've never seen before, never experienced before. And some of you here have never even experienced that peace that passes all understanding. As all of us, all of you here are standing. Perhaps someone here. Holy Spirit is impressing. Make a call. Somebody here. 
you brought them to so they can commit their life for the first time to commit and say to Jesus you want to be a savior with your heads bowed and all eyes closed right now if you haven't prayed that prayer of asking Jesus in your life I want you to repeat after me say Lord Jesus I invite you in my heart today I give you my all please forgive me my sins thank you for sending Jesus on the cross to die for my sins oh help me live for Jesus my friend if you pray that prayer then you just receive salvation eternal life and then I'm going to make an appeal here for those of you who say, you know what? I haven't been baptized yet. I want to be part of what the Bible is talking about, a group of people who will follow the Lamb wherever He goes. You haven't made that decision, but yet the Holy Spirit has been working in your heart. If that is you, my friend, if you want to commit your life to the Lord, I'm going to invite you to come to the front here and join us. Join me in the front and saying, I want to give my life to Jesus. Step forward and come and join to the front and, and commit your life to the Lord and say, I want to prepare for baptism. I want to prepare my life for Jesus Christ. Don't hold back. Come to the front. With all heads bowed, and the Holy Spirit calling you, then you come forward. Amen. Where are my, my elders? Come. I want my elders to be praying for you as you're coming to the front here. Pray for them as they're for coming to the front. Amen. God's calling you. Amen, sister. Amen, brother. Don't hold back. Somebody here still needs to commit their life to the Lord and have not been baptized, come and join. Don't hold back. This is the Holy Spirit calling. I'm not going to do this for a long time, but I don't want to put a pressure on you, but I want the Holy Spirit to be the one bringing conviction. If you believe that the Holy Spirit has been calling you, then come. Don't hold back. Amen, brother. Come to the front and join us here. Is there someone else that would like to say, I want to, I want to prepare my life for Jesus. I want to commit all to him. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know this song, Open My Eyes, Lord. Sing it now. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. Oh, reach out and touch him. And say that I love him. And say. Open my ears, Lord. Open my ears, Lord. And help me to listen. And help me to listen. Open my ears, Lord. Amen. Holy Spirit's calling you. Come to the front. Come to the front. Some of you here want, needs to be rebaptized because you have walked away from God. God has not been foremost in your life. And now is the time to say, I want to come back. I want to make it right with God. Holy Spirit's calling you. Come to the front. Join us here.
there anyone here else? Who else would like to come and say, Lord, Lord, count me in? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most important part of the service here. It's where we're committing it all to Jesus. Is there anyone here who else would like to say, Lord, open my eyes. I want to see Jesus. I want Jesus in my heart. I want to just make one more final appeal. If that's you, the Holy Spirit's calling, come and join us. Don't hold back. Amen, brother. Amen. Don't hold that. Heaven rejoices when you make a decision for Him. This is a very important eternal decision. Some of you need to be rebaptized. You know what's going on in your life. God knows. Then you need to recommit all to Jesus. I will just make one final call, then I will close this part here with a prayer. Is there anyone else, else who would like to step forward? Lord, please, I want to belong to you all the way. Let's sing that final part right there. Father in heaven, we have gathered here in this holy place of yours. Lord, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. Thank, thank you, Father, for the people that came to the front here to commit their lives, to be baptized, to make this important decision. We praise you and we thank you. Lord, we pray that we can be a people, Lord, who will be a new generation and will say, Lord Jesus, count me in. I want to make sure I am in tune with you, that I can see you, I can hear your voice. Oh, Father, we pray. You've given us the greatest privilege to be partners with you. And so, Lord, I pray in this service, in this service, as we have gathered here now, I present these people to you for your glory and for your honor. This we pray in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Amen.